Welcome to the Road to Acapulco. There's a new idea in town, an idea that's been heralded by Bob Podolsky for 32 years. It's an idea that will change the world, and it's beginning to take shape in Acapulco. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Road to Acapulco. This is Michael Nimitz, and Bob Podolsky is sitting here next to me. And uh, this is episode 16, and in today's topic, we're going to go a little bit uh, off the beaten path and talk about fear. Uh, I've had a few discussions over the past few days about fear and been looking into it. There's, there's quite a bit about fear as a motivator, as an industry, uh, as part of our culture. Uh, we're going to try and cover all those, and then also point out why an octolog would be a great place to dispel a lot of fear. But initially, I think uh, there's probably a couple things that would that kind of identifies it best. And there's a BBC documentary called The Power of Nightmares mm. that talks about uh, the, the whole war on terror and how that all got started. And, and essentially, it's you know, how people are motivated by fear. And, uh, you know, this whole idea of Al-Qaeda and terrorism obviously works because it just seems to proliferate and everywhere you go now, there's terrorists all over the place. And, uh, you know, of course, governments uh, point those out so that people, people will cower to the fear and, uh, you know, do what the government says. But there's a lot of other uh, things about fear that uh, are interesting. And, and why do people seem to always be fearful of everything? Everything that we hear in the news, of course, is, is about fear, whether it be crime or uh, climate change or vaccinations or uh, health care. Is there anything that isn't got a fear message these days that's on the news, uh, Bob? Fear is profitable, you know, for the, for people who are selling it in one form or another. It's very profitable. All the people who are making billions of dollars selling uh, war equipment of various kinds, you know, whether you're talking about cannons or aircraft carriers or bombs, all of those manufacturers are doing really well off of fear. And yet, uh, the reality is that most of, uh, most of the fear that is uh, promulgated politically turns out to be stuff that doesn't have much reality except for the actions of government uh, whooping it up. So I don't, I don't see fear as uh, a huge challenge long long term but in the short term we do come into the world as infants and we are frightened very early and this this is why i keep telling people that soul bonding is important because it's a way of dealing with the consequences of the very early fears character structure is a fear dominated phenomenon in which we attempt, as very small children, as, as infants or toddlers, we attempt to protect ourselves out of fear from experiences that we have had during that time period. And when we get rid of those aspects of uh, our culture, so that infants and toddlers are no longer traumatized, those fears will go away. And the governments uh, will not be able to prey on those fears any further. But that's a long ways off, as I see it. Yeah, well, there's, a, <clears throat> there's another documentary that I'm thinking of, and I think it's a National Geographic's uh, uh, documentary about stress and how stress is like the ultimate murder. Uh, you know, people, uh, you know, I, I guess the... Uh, background of, of stress is the, the fight or flight idea mm -hmm. that uh, an animal out there in the in the jungle or something that's uh, a prey to another animal essentially has that sense that 
there might be somebody out there that could harm me. And so it goes into this fight or flight mode where it either is going to fight for its life or run for its life. And, uh, you know, but that circumstance only takes maybe a minute or two of their whole day and then they're back to a normal stamp, uh, standard. Right. Whereas humans, on the other hand, have this kind of uh, perception of fear that can create the, f- the fight or flight kind of circumstances within their body. Mm-hmm. And this is what most people call stress. Mm-hmm. But what it, what it does is because that fight or flight, uh, what is it, mode, puts the body in a circumstance where, you know, it shuts down all the non-essential functions. So things like digestion are basically put on the back burner. And if the if a person is stressed for a long period of time, for days or months or weeks or years even, uh, that has some really dramatic effects on the body. Yes, it does. And so, uh, you know, the, being that the current, the current situation in the United States is this fear-based mentality where if people read the newspaper or watch the news, they're constantly being presented with things to be worried about. And so I can only, you know, I can only uh, imagine what the effects of people on people are that have a constant fear thing going on in their in their head. When it's a low-level phenomenon, we refer to it usually as anxiety. And it can become extremely intense and extremely prolonged and result in all kinds of very severe health problems, not the least of which is cancer. There's been a lot of studies done that show that cancer correlates with stress. You have a lot of stress over a long period, you're much more likely to get cancer. The body shuts down portions of the immune system in response to that. Terrible for the body. Yeah, yeah so so the, this fear thing, it also has some interesting circumstances with kind of like the way that the political uh, parties kind of come down. Mm. So like uh, if you're afraid of a particular thing, you kind of fall into a particular category. And then once you're in that particular category, you're also kind of associating with, you know, all these other beliefs. So like if you're a Democrat and you don't believe in, in global warming, <clears throat> you've got a problem. Do you become a Republican then because you're a, a global warming denier or do you... <laughs> It's definitely divisive. But what what does that do as far as, you know, grouping people into particular categories and and then actually stressing them out more? Because now if they're going against the group with, you know, just a particular skepticism about something leads them into, you know, basically being uh, alienated from everybody else. And so, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I characterize the United States as almost an insane asylum. And, you know, with just constant fear messages going on. And any, if any of those fears are doubted, well, who do you turn to? You, you can't really turn to anybody because everybody's in the fear, fear mode for the most part. Yeah, most people, yeah. Everybody's got their their pleas, like, uh, you know, if it's the Republicans, it's Obamacare or, or something along those lines, or, you know, regulations or the government intrusion into liberties and so forth. You know, everybody has their fear messages that, uh, you know, the, the wor- end of the world is coming and, mm. you know, all these things are going to get us. But the reality is, is that uh, we we are very capable, and the the more that we're uh, given uh, a confidence in our own ability and skills, the better off we are. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, let's just kind of delve into, uh, I guess, fear as a motivator. 
Okay. <clears throat> well, it's certainly a powerful motivator. And under what I think of as normal or benign circumstances, it's, it's an, an occasional thing that comes up under unusual circumstances. Where I see it as, as really dangerous is that we now have a culture that promotes fear under circumstances that are basically not dangerous. And we're convinced that there's danger when there isn't. Uh, how we became susceptible to that, I'm not really sure. But it seems like a pattern that's been around for a long time. That politicians, military figures, generals, uh, statesmen, and so on, they seem to make a lot of capital out of promoting fear. That, oh, yes, here are some brown people on the other side of the world, and by golly, we're going to really suffer if we don't go and attack them. Uh, that's not the same phenomenon as happened when, you know, when we were living in caves and we were worried about the saber-toothed tiger coming and get us. Right. It's a very different thing, and it's manufactured very systematically. The people who are promoting fear, I think most of them know exactly what they're doing. Yeah, it's interesting, like the, the medical industry, it seems like, and certainly the uh, psychological field, uh, uh, psychiatrists and so forth with the DSM, you know, 30, 40 years ago, there was maybe, what, like 10 or 15 mental conditions? Pretty and small numbers. there's like 700 or something? I don't even know how many. Yeah, they've been proliferating, that's for sure. <laughs> and the people who run that industry, again, it's a cartel-run industry, and they make a lot of money by promoting, by, by expanding all the different ways that you can be categorized and uh, uh, diagnosed and uh, treated. Okay, I, I personally have a great disdain for psychological treatment, whether it's from a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a, a clinical social worker. The whole idea of treatment is that Person A is going to perform something on the person B. And person B is passive. Person A, these days, mostly, is prescribing pills. But whatever it is they're doing, it's like the surgeon. <laughs> you're not responsible. You're going to be unconscious when I work on you. And, and, the, and the people in the, in the psychiatric industry have the same mindset. It's like all of us are passive. We don't know anything. We're stupid. You know, and, and, and this, this go, of course, goes along with the whole government mentality. You know, the public is dumb as shit and doesn't know anything and has to be told what to do. Wow. And as soon as we're convinced of that, we become the victims of that. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, and it's not just the, the big things. It's also, like, the little things. I, I remember as a kid, you know, riding a bicycle and I, I uh, rode a motorcycle, uh, at four years old, mm. uh, most of the time without a helmet, without any protective gear, you know, uh, just, you know, I guess would be completely crazy today in today's world because today children can't even get on a bicycle without having to put a helmet on. Right. Uh, everything has to have barriers and hand guards and safety features. Signs. <sighs> warnings. <sighs> There's just nothing you can do in the United States that isn't possibly harmful that they have to put a warning sticker on. Right. Uh, and, you know, it, it just gets ridiculous how much stuff out there is being done because people might be afraid of it. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a lot of activities that we used to do as children that are no longer permitted. Government has stepped in and said, oh, you're not to do this, you're not to do that. I can remember when I was, uh, I think I was just turning 15, I think, 15. I, I, I had a friend, who, he and I got interested in juggling. And so after practicing with other things, we got out in the backyard and we decided to essentially play catch with hand axes, 
literally, we would st- we would stand about twenty feet apart, and each of us would hold an axe, and each of us would throw the axe to the other simultaneously. They'd cross in the air, and we'd catch them by the handle. Imagine doing that today. Yeah, if your parents let you do that today, by golly, you'd go to jail. You're, they'd go to jail for, for neglect at, or, or something of the sort. And yet, we, we did it. We were very careful. You could bet, because we knew we could get hurt if we, were making a, if we made a mistake. We were very careful, very systematic about the practice. We got pretty good at it. We had fun. And then we tired of it and quit, you know? Today, such behavior... I mean, even just taking an unsupervised walk in the woods today would would be considered, uh, you know, bad parenting on on the part of the people that let you do it. So. Isn't isn't there something to that about <clears throat> about taking risk? Mm-hmm. That is a lesson in itself. Mm-hmm. That people really do need to find out how much risk is useful mm-hmm. and what risk is dangerous. And yeah. Knowing the difference between those two, and and not knowing that is, I think, certainly a, a problem. Oh yeah, yeah. I I have uh, all of my adult life. I have been a risk taker. At least I think of myself that way. And I have many times found myself surrounded by people who are not risk takers. It's not very pleasant hanging out with people that are so averse to risk that they get angry at those who take the risks. That's the interesting part. Why would someone be angry? I'm going to risk my safety, my health, my something or other, my money, whatever, and someone else gets mad at me for doing that? I mean, it's craziness, as you said. Insanity. But it happens all the time. But just to kind of bring it back to what our, what yeah. the, the motivation, it, it's obvious that fear is a great motivator because all these things out there, all these safety messages, all these terrorists and all this other stuff that, that keeps people moving in a, in a particular direction, it's, it's obvious that the masses are moved by fear. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's obvious that large, vast majorities of people can be manipulated through fear in a variety of ways, whether it's selling products or selling politics or selling politicians or selling wars. Uh, Lots of ways. There are lots of ways that fear comes into the equation. And that is what creates the culture that we we have uh, become a species that at least in the United States, more than elsewhere, I'd say. Uh, I'm, there are probably some other countries that are similarly uh, risk-averse, and certainly the United States has been influential overseas in promoting the fear. We hear this all the time, actually, if you're attentive to, to the news. But it's not a, ne- a necessary part of our survival on the planet. In other words, yeah, when we were living in caves and there were saber-toothed tigers, <laughs> we had to be really careful. Uh, and we've outgrown a huge percentage of that uh, reality risk. In other words, yeah, there are, still, there are still animals out there that'll kill you, but uh, mo- a lot of them have become extinct <laughs> thanks to human behavior. Uh, and it's no longer a major factor. You, you, I go walk down the street. Uh, I'm not worried about tigers coming and eating me. And I, you know, people swim in the ocean uh, usually without worrying too much about the sharks that could come and eat them. Although they could, and they do occasionally, but it's an unusual happening. It's not the norm. It isn't something that one has to. I mean, it's like a little bit like. Well, in the case of terrorism, for example, being going around fearful of terrorism, uh, that's a kind of paranoia, actually, because the probability of your being killed by a terrorist is extremely low. You're more likely to be killed by a bolt of lightning. Uh, how, how much do you go around fearing the lightning? Not that much. So, you know, as you mentioned, paranoia, the, you know, the, this push for legalization of marijuana, 
And the, the combination of this massive amount of fear in the United States, do you think that's kind of a ploy to, to kind of exacerbate people's paranoia and, and utilize that paranoia to, to get people? I mean, you know, mm-hmm. the government has certainly been interested in medicating the population and maybe the, the marijuana uh, side effect of paranoia might be useful to them. <laughs> well, that's a possibility. Although I think that there, I don't think there is agreement among the fear mongers as to whether that paranoia is useful uh, for their purposes or not. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's been this very long, very prolonged uh, debate over the role of marijuana uh, in, in, in our society. I think there are very good reasons for encouraging the use of marijuana instead of some of the uh, drugs that are being sold by the pharmaceutical companies. They don't want it because it's competition. Their sales have diminished in those states that legalize marijuana. And they see a pattern in that. Oh, my gosh, there's a lot of money going to be lost there. We better get somebody uh, somebody like Sessions in the, uh, in, in the government to crack down on this stuff and, uh, you know, make it go away so that we can keep selling this stuff that kills people gradually, or not so gradually, uh, instead of marijuana. Well, there, it seems to me like the these further on states that have, are passing legalized marijuana laws are, are kind of uh, passing a government-regulated type industry that will more than likely end up being put into the hands of the GMO type manufacturers mm-hmm. and who's to say what kind of uh, GMO type of marijuana really? substance they'll come up with and I, I'm sure it could uh, it could exacerbate that paranoia yeah. function yeah, and uh, you know people you know, would just be worse off, especially if they consider it uh, part of their medication. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think uh, that's where we're headed, that as marijuana becomes legalized, it's going to become totally controlled, whereas today it's a gray market where it's largely uncontrolled. And, yeah, it's uh, just as well to make it, to, to decriminalize it completely, I, I certainly approve of that. <laughs> decriminalize it completely, let people do anything they want with it, uh, leave it to the individual. That would be a very ethical outcome. And it's also, at this point, a very unlikely outcome because governments almost never make ethical decisions. If you <laughs> haven't noticed, you know, they're consistently unethical. This is one of the hallmarks of government is that they seem incapable of making ethical decisions. So, you know, the United States, I think, uh, prior to the mid-1900s, I think, was a pretty resilient, entrepreneurial type of culture Mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, pretty much did did stuff for themselves and, and did not rely on the government for practically anything. But uh, as time has gone on here in the, in the later 20th century and uh, into our 21st century, it's obvious that the fear message has become part of the culture, mm-hmm. uh, almost to the point that it's, it's, I think, worse than anywhere else in the world as far as its allegiance to fear and fear messaging. But, uh, you know, that's part of our culture. It's also part of the business structure, right? And there's quite a few businesses that uh, that function because of the fear message. Even even the car companies, you know, have gotten into the safety uh, mode where they, you know, all they do is talk about how safe their cars are and, and how, clean running. <clears throat> yeah, you don't want to damage the uh, environment or or hurt anybody. Right, get rid of CO two. So it's ridiculous, of course. So it's uh, it's it's kind of interesting how it's become part of the industry. The, the I think what is really interesting about this whole fear uh, you know, philosophy 
is that it opens up a great deal of opportunity for those people that aren't afraid. True. Sure. Now, you know, in the United States, I think it's in, practically impossible because of the rules and regulations that if you don't do the standard fear uh, response, you're basically an outlaw. Right. And so... Uh, right, uh, they outlaw. This is, this is due to the cartelization of, of our country, of the United States, uh, and, and other countries. Cartelization has that effect, that uh, <laughs> the, the government winds up uh, supporting monopolies, shared monopolies, that, whose only purpose is to maximize their profits and maintain their monopoly status. That's what cartels do, and they do it through government. Government acts on their behalf, enforces their rules, and of course the government gets something out of it too. It's a two-way street, because people in government love to have more power, and if you give them one more area to be in charge of, well, then they can hire more people, and those people who are the bosses in that setting acquire more status because the group that they're supervising gets bigger. And so government employees love to be in charge of bigger and bigger groups that work for them. And so they will encourage uh, the expansion of any kind of laws, even if the laws are highly unethical. Well, like, for example, the, uh, the vaccination thing. Oh, if yeah. you refuse to vaccinate, especially your children, Mm -hmm. uh, you're certainly on the verge of being considered a, a, a criminal. Right now in Texas, uh, I believe it was the governor of Texas uh, uh, or, or some high-level official who recently said that the government of Texas has the right, they own your children, in fact, and have the right to vaccinate them whether you like it or not. To me, that's horrendous. You know, when I was a kid... I had one vaccination for smallpox, a little scratchy thing on my shoulder, and it left a little scar, and I was left immune to smallpox. I never got smallpox. Now, there are literally dozens of things for which they're vaccinating, and they're giving very, very small children multiple vaccination shots, one after another after another, or combine them. And the result is we've got all kinds of health problems in, in infants that we didn't have before. You know? so, so abiding by the fear message essentially puts these children in, in harm's way. Oh, yeah. And, and there's been a study recently that, that came out that, that essentially compared vaccinated children versus non-vaccinated children. Right. Almost every case, the vaccinated children suffered more diseases and and problems than the non-vaccinated. Right. So going against the grain on this one actually is healthier for you. Right. But it's dangerous because the government is going to potentially put you in jail or take your children. Right. Your kid's not allowed to go to school where if he's unvaccinated, he might infect the people in the school. That is really bizarre because consider the fact that if all the students in the school are vaccinated, they're supposedly immune to whatever you might have. Why, what, what, what's the risk to them if one or two or even a small handful of unvaccinated children come into the group? They might get sick, but they're not going to infect those vaccinated kids because they're safe. They're immune. Well, ha, that's, ha, ha. that's that's the herd mentality. Yeah, right? they call it that. The herd has to be vaccinated. At least seventy-five to eighty-five percent of the herd has to be vaccinated to make the vaccinations fully effective. At least that's the that's argument, the mythology of it. But th there's another thing that is interesting to me, and it re relates to the medical field, and that is that. Uh, you know, a lot of people that are diagnosed with different diseases these days, cancer, uh, you know, essentially once they're diagnosed, they immediately go into treatment. And there's, you know, obviously a fear of getting a disease or having a disease is, is pretty, uh, uh, you know, shaking as, a, as an experience. Oh, yeah. People mortgage their homes in order to pay for the treatments that have no possibility of curing them. Yeah. But the the thing that really 
blows my mind is that uh, a study was recently done on people that go for a second opinion. Right. And that more than 80% uh, of, the, of the people that went for a second opinion got a different diagnosis. Right. So, you know, I mean, that just gives, gives us an indication of how, how the fear, the fear from the system of like the, you know, like going against the authority, the fear of being given or, you know, essentially taking on a disease and what that might mean to your life. And, and I guess almost a, you know, kind of an attention that people get from having a disease. Mm -hmm. You know, people get a lot of, of support and stuff. For being sick. Yeah. And so it's, it's you know, not many people go for the second uh, opinion. Right. Because it, it kind of means that now they get a little more attention, too. That plus the fact that if they ask for a second opinion, they're expressing a distrust potentially a distrust of the first opinion. Yeah. And if the first opinion is given to you by your family doctor or someone you have uh, been told you, your life depends on trusting this person, and you might be reluctant to express any distrust or any doubt or skepticism or even questioning, you know. So I, I totally agree with, with that, and I see that as uh, part of the culture that we have been, that has been created in order to manipulate us. Culture, you know, it's kind of interesting. People, people often talk about uh, the world is the way it is because of human nature, as if human nature was fixed. When reality is, human nature is not fixed. It's changing all the time. And the influence of the media on human nature is profound. The things that we consider normal human nature keep changing in response to what the media is telling us. And human nature today is very, very different than it was when I was a kid. Okay? For those who don't know me, I'm almost 80 years old, and I remember everything from my childhood, and I remember a level of freedom that children had when I was a kid that today is unheard of. We've lost so much freedom, even as kids. And of course, if we lose it as kids, we, we, we don't get it back when we become adults. On the contrary, it becomes harder to get it, to get the freedom back. Uh, and, and I've pretty much devoted my life to trying to counter, you know, count, create a counter effect, you know, to protect people from the, these effects. And it's a, it's a very uphill job at this point because most people are so indoctrinated. They are so fearful of so many things and don't even realize it most of the time. Yeah, I, I, I can say myself, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, in business, dealing with myriad of government regulations and rules and, and people and bodies and uh, agencies and all that kind of stuff, I got to the point that I thought, you know, to be an entrepreneur in the United States, it's just about worthless insane you know, because, because it, there's just so much so many risks involved with all these different things and so many things that are legal and people to be afraid of you know every opportunity there's there's people that are you know and even your neighbors are out looking at what you're doing and oh my god tattling they, they're letting they're letting their children ride bicycles without their helmets on. <gasps> oh my Somebody gosh. better report them. Yeah, know? yeah. <sighs> I can remember my mother teaching me when I was quite small. I must have been, oh, eight, ten years old. I remember her teaching me not to tattletale and how telling me stories about how in her childhood, in her school experience back in Wales and Cardiff, uh, kids who, were, who would tattle on one another would be ostracized by the rest of their class when they did that. That the class would, would not put up with tattling. They would literally stop speaking to someone who was a tattletale until they changed their opinion of them, which sometimes never happened. Uh, th this was a, a group decision on the part of these classes, and it really was in support of individual freedom. 
don't go tattling on someone that breaks a rule. If you do, you're in trouble. And that idea, I'm going to see that you're in trouble, is an individual thing. Each person individually in the class would say, okay, I'm not going to go on being friends with that guy. He's a tattletale. Today, tattletales are being encouraged the same way Hitler encouraged tattling back in, back in the 30s. Today, people are being encouraged to tell on each other. And I think that this is just part of the fear culture that is encouraged by government. And people are not educated to resist. When I was a kid, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, sentiment uh, in, among adults and teachers and so on. There was still a lot of sentiment in support of individualism. Today, it's mostly gone. Well, I think they, they have used individualism, I think, to a large degree because they've broken up, you know, the family structure. They've broken up just about every type of support network that people had mm -hmm. in, in the past. Right, they've and weakened so, them. Yes. So people are essentially on their own. They don't have a support structure, even their family to rely on. In fact, in a lot of cases, they're... Uh, you know, kind of uh, alienated from their own family mm -hmm. uh, circumstances through whatever, you know, obviously through the media and stuff like that, movies and so forth, have created a lot of these uh, problems with families and stuff. And of course, the violent nature of culture is not helped either. But uh, people are really in a very weak state when they don't have anyone else to rely on. That's true, though I don't, I don't equate that with individualism. I, I think that forcing people to be isolated from each other is not the same thing as encouraging individualism. Encouraging individualism can be done within a supportive network. And in fact, I see that in, 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 in the Octolog uh, model. I see that this is a model where people can be very individualistic and still belong, still fit in, still have... Uh, the support of their group. And that's one of the possibilities that uh, has come to into my awareness. Uh, as an adult, I certainly had no idea as a child, you know. None, there's a lot there's a lot of what we're talking about that could be taught to children and isn't. Yeah. It's like secret. Yeah. You don't want children to know this stuff. Well it's you know the the old adage, united we stand, divided we fall. Mm. The, They've segregated everybody into their weakest position. Right. And the, the whole system, I think, preys on that. And I, I think that's another indication that the, uh, that, you know, the fear message is working and, and the system understands that this, the fear message is working because they're basically taking that apart, you know, they're, they're pursuing that and it, it works. Yes. And so, uh, you know, in t talking about like the opportunities, you know, the United States, in my mind, is just inundated with fear and weakness, and so it's it's in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you compare Mexico to the United States, all those things that we mentioned aren't the case here. Uh, they do have a f strong family structure. They aren't afraid of little things. There isn't safety measures put on any practically anything. There's right. no safety measures for anything. Everybody is is able to do pretty much whatever they want. Kids run all over the neighborhoods. Kids can basically cross the city in a in a bus on their own and no right. one seems to even notice. Right. No one thinks twice about it. That's quite true. And and you also see it in the traffic patterns here. Uh I've I've observed that uh, here in Acapulco, uh, there are there are stoplights, a few here and there on, on the main roads. There are stoplights, and frequently people find it convenient and useful to stop for the red light. But if they slow down for the red light and there's nothing coming on any of the cross streets, they'll just ignore the bloody red light and go ahead, and nobody seems to care. You don't even hear horns honking at them for, for going through the red light because people are smart enough to make sure, generally, 
that when they go through the red light, they're not going to have an accident. They're looking for the cross traffic. And there are, there are intersections here with six or seven streets coming together in a big, a big, a big, uh, uh, area, uh, which may or may not be a roundabout, or it just may be a big open area where the streets join. And people are going, coming and going all the time. It's, it's beautiful. And I just, I wish that were so in the States, but in the States, these places would be surrounded by cops who are just waiting to stop and plunder you for, oh, you ignored the stoplight. Oh, you rolled through the stop sign. Oh my goodness. You know, here, we have a lot more freedom. <laughs> we don't have to worry about those things. Yeah, well, another thing is, is that freedom also equals opportunity, and opportunity equals prosperity. True. And that's that's certainly another thing that I think is something that, you know, escaping the fear and understanding the opportunities, there's a ton of opportunities with mm. the technology that the United States and, and the people of the United States have been exposed to coming to a place like Mexico. Right. Uh, there's all kinds of opportunities for all kinds of neat things to happen. True. Uh, just everywhere you go, there's opportunities. Oh, we're surrounded by opportunity here. And, and in fact, uh, from my perspective, many, many, many of the things that are useful and taken for granted in the States don't exist here yet. And every one of those things is something that someone coming down here from the States could look around and say, oh, what do you know? I don't see any of this happening. I'm going to start a business. And there's nothing to stop them. Right. They don't have to register it. They don't have to, you know, they don't have to make it official with paperwork with the government. Most of the people here, their attitude is they'd rather not deal with anything to do with the government. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. There should be a little bit of caution there because if you establish a you know typical brick and mortar type business here in Mexico, you know on the main street or whatever, there's going to be a time where the government officials are going to come and visit you. But in most cases, uh, there's there's always an opportunity for uh, you know an alternative path right. to getting that problem right. resolved. Right. It's not like, well, if you don't have your papers, we're shutting you down and that's the end of it. No, it's more like, you don't have your papers, we'll sell them to you if you want. <laughs> what are you willing to pay? We want so much for it. Oh, well, no, I'm not going to pay you that much. Well, how about this much? Well, half of that. Okay. I mean, there's, there's this sense that government officials can be bargained with. Yeah. And we didn't have that much in the States. But here, it's normal. Yeah. Here, the people who are wearing uniforms, they know perfectly well that they don't have any recognizable authority other than they can, they can harass you a bit. <laughs> they can, they can uh, create some challenges for you. But for the most part, you can ignore them with impunity. And it doesn't take a big reward for you to give them for them to leave you alone. Yeah. And I see that this, this can become here, uh, especially here in this part of the world, this part of Mexico, I can see where the opportunity to essentially create uh, a free market or what amounts to a free market is, is a very high probability that here we have the, the means and the, and the motives and the lack of constraints necessary to create what amounts to one of the first free markets in the world. And well, there, there are probably some elsewhere. In fact, I'm sure there are uh, here and there. But they're scarce and they're rare. And I'm really excited about seeing that evolving here. Well, the final point I want to talk about is the, the octologue in regard to this fear and also the opportunity that this fear system gives us. Mm. And, you know, and, and certainly in Mexico, uh, with people that are coming from the United States or other Western countries, countries and coming to somewhere like Mexico, having the mentality that you need an octologue and how the octologue functions, I think really makes it an exciting opportunity because not only do we have the freedom and the, the people that are willing to work and, and the opportunity to, to 
you know, to exploit tons of different opportunities, we've also got this organizational structure that fits into this system. And, and essentially, the Aqualog is something that the powers that be really don't understand how to deal with, right. especially with their fear mechanism. Right. The fear mechanism works on the people that are weak. It doesn't work on a group of people that work together. That's true. That people who are really in sync with each other, who are in rapport with each other, who trust each other, who share in one another's ups and downs, uh, that's, a, that's a culture where outsiders, like government people, have very little opportunity to, to be influential. And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. I love it. I, I really am excited being part of, uh, of this community uh, because it's like nothing I've ever experienced before and comes a lot closer to what I've always wanted to be a part of than anything I experienced back in the States. Even when I was living in a state where there was a very strong so-called freedom activist movement, Arizona, uh, I never felt as free there as I do here, that's for sure. Yeah, so so the the opportunities with the the Octolog mm -hmm. are immense. But let's talk a little bit about the individual impact of someone that has some fear, let's say about starting a business mm -hmm. or or operating a business and decides, you know, the Octolog would be the way to do it. What kind of benefits could they realize mm. through doing that in regard to the fear? Well, I see a lot of... Uh, uh, it, it, it's hard to make a list exactly, but I would say that when you have six, seven, eight other people in your group and you are accustomed to trusting them and they trust you and whatever is going on with you emotionally, you can share with the group and, and experience their support... Uh, it's, it really changes things for one because you don't have, you, you don't have this sense of isolation. You don't feel like you're alone with the problem because you're not. Uh, that's a huge benefit. Just that alone is a huge benefit. Plus the fact that you've got seven or eight additional brains working on solving the problem. That's a big thing too because Usually when I have a fear of something, it, it, I become aware of it through a problem that it generates for me. Oh, I want to do this, but if I do, I'm afraid that I'm going to suffer that. And what am I going to do about that? So in an octolog, you have allies. You have close, trustworthy friends helping you solve the problems. And very frequently, due to the syner synergistic effect of the group, under those conditions, very frequently, you're going to be able to solve the problem. I'm not saying every conceivable problem would be easily solved, but I am suggesting that even the most complex problems can be solved in that manner, using the tools of the Octolog, and that is a fantastic benefit that I don't see in other cultures. There are a few other cultures that utilize some of the same techniques, if you will, uh, beneficially. The, uh, in the United States, there is a society of Sikhs, for example. Now, originally, Sikhs came from uh, India, Pakistan, that area, uh, and, and they had a certain kind of history and a background. Uh, they were uh, either respected or feared by other groups, but they were a community. And that community sense has been translated into English, so to speak. And so in the United States, there is now a society of Sikhs that is a network for mutual support. I think that's wonderful. I don't think it has the, be the benefits that uh, a whole amount of octologues would have, but it's a good thing. There are such examples the whole amount of octologues is essentially takes the same networking concept and amplifies it or strengthens it. Uh, it it's, a, it's a matter of degree. It's not totally one way or the other. It's a matter of 
okay, here's, here's a way that a network can be formed that has some very, very demonstrable advantages. The unanimous decisions within the Octolog are a perfect example of that. Okay, you, you can't get an Octolog to act unethically if the Octolog actually understands the ethics, which is part of what makes it an Octolog. If a, if a group of eight people does not understand and live by the ethics, it's not an octolog. It's just a committee of eight. But once they get it, once they understand the ethics, you're not going to persuade anyone in that group to, to go along with some kind of a proposal or a plan to do something unethical. It, it's just there's too much uh, uh, weight of understanding and knowledge uh, in the way of that happening. And because of that, it becomes essentially impossible for uh, a group of people who want to do something unethical to take over an octolog. It can't happen. Not when the octolog has been established properly and knows what it's doing. It cannot be successfully infiltrated. And that means that the psychopaths and, and the other uh, exploiters, takers, uh, who want to uh, influence what happens in that group are unable to do so and because of that they go away. A day will come when we're going to have millions and millions of people in whole amounts of octologues and the people who are the psychopaths and sociopaths who try to control everything they're just not going to have any traction anymore. Well one of the things that I, I think of when a you know, talking about an aqualog in like a business circumstance is the, you know, as an individual entrepreneur, I've certainly seen this a lot, is there's a lot of fears involved in starting a business. Yeah. Let's say, for example, you, you, you know, you do need to take on like an accountant or something like that. You don't know if that accountant is screwing you. Mm -hmm. you know, because you don't have enough expertise or let's say you have to uh, put together a, a website or something like that. You've got to hire someone to, to do that. Again, you go through this fear circumstance where it's, well, do I know what they're doing? I, you know, I got some questions. Did, did they give me the right stuff? Did they tell me everything that, that on the proposal? There's just a, a myriad of fears or that excited. can happen yeah. Yeah. for a sole proprietor or someone that's a a small business person, and all these kind of things are really dissipated in an octolog because right. if, if I've got a, a fear about, well, let's see, did, did my, the contractor I hired, did he really cover everything that is necessary for this particular project? Or is he just going to try and nickel and dime me for the next however long? And, you know, how do I know what, what kind of quality he delivers and stuff like that? Well, when I've got seven other people that are kind of going through and verifying that, yeah, this is the person that we want, this is what the, the tasks that need to be handled, the amount of expertise that comes from each one of those decisions makes those decisions happen so much more quickly. Mm. Because, like, for example, if you're hiring somebody, it might take you a month to go through the process of, you know, getting, starting the relationship, going through the process of understanding what each side wants, and then coming to a number, and then maybe negotiating through that, and then a plan of action. Whereas with an Octolog, if, if the, you know, if the person presents themselves to the Octolog, more than likely that next week we've got pretty much everything covered. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, I think in, in those aspects, you know, and again, this is about fear. You know, it also has to do with reality, of course. Right. But, but the, the, all those resources being put at, at any one individual's hands to get something done is an amazing resource. That's true. And the more resourceful we are, the less fearful. Yeah. So that's another piece of the, piece of the pie here that, you, you join an octolog and you, you have resources you can count on without having to spend months checking them out. All of that, in effect, will have been done ahead of time. 
And, and let, let's let's say you know you're an individual and you've got this million dollar idea, and you know you want to you want to get a business started and you want to get it off the ground, but you're just by yourself. And of course, you're going to need other people, and you're going to have to deal with all the rules and regulations and all the other things that come about. But you 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 know you want to hold on to that million dollar idea really tight, and you don't want to share it with people that that might screw you up. Right. Don't want it stolen from him. But if if you just alleviated that fear a little and understood that the octalog is the way to get that thing realized, the chances of you getting, you know, your million dollar business, now of course you're gonna to have to share it with the other members of the octalog. But the reality is, is that your chances of succeeding now are so much greater, right, and bigger that your uh, that the opportunity is is much bigger, and so the right. potential for you losing it if you just went on it by yourself is probably about ninety five percent with the you know standard startup business uh, chances of of actually realizing success. I think about 95% of businesses that start fail in the first five years. Right. So with an Oculog, of course, you know, we're just getting started. We don't know what the stats are, but I would suggest that it's probably better than 50%. Oh, yeah. Which means that, uh, you know, you're, what, 100 times more effective than if you tried doing it yourself? Another piece of that that I see as relevant is that if I'm, Doing business by myself, I own 100% of the business, but I also have 100% of the problems. Right. If I create an octolog to be the business, if I can do that, even though my share may only be an eighth, the output could be a hundred or a thousand times bigger than it would be for me alone. Yeah. Well, I'd rather have one eighth of a thousand times bigger business than have 100% of something that's just me. And this is the kind of decision making that octolog entrepreneurs are able to contemplate. And that, and that's another thing is, uh, you know, everybody isn't a jack of all trades, right? And so, putting together an organization that has the skills and abilities that really make the business effective uh, means that a person that has, uh, like myself, I'm an idea guy. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I've got some great ideas, but I'm not a detail guy. I'm not going to spend all my time, you know, making sure everything is in the right order. Everything is, you know, every I is dotted and every T is crossed. That's not really my forte. Yes. And to have somebody that can do that for me mm. is is incredibly effective because now all I get to do is do my ideas. Right. Let someone else do all the other stuff, and I get to move on to other ideas instead of spending my entire life. You know, if I if I have a great idea that's a that's a particular business, now I end up kind of chaining myself to this great idea. But I've also got to run a business now. Right. Right. That's very true. Very true. That. Uh, one of the advantages of the Octolog is its ability to uh, facilitate specialization on the part of the individual. So each person does what they are really good at, and someone else handles the other stuff because it's, re- it's what they're really good at. You know, many years ago, in the early days of the Internet, I, I was building websites and made a really serious attempt to make a business of building websites for other people. But most people didn't know they needed a website in those days. I'm looking at the early 90s. Most people had no idea what a website even is, let alone that they could benefit from having one. So I was doing a lot of very detailed work, writing code, writing HTML, uh, building databases, which I was then able to upload to a server and, and... have them accessible with drill down procedures through through the forms on the page. I, I used to do that kind of stuff, but it wasn't my forte. It was never what I was really good at. And so I wasted a lot of time, 
I didn't, I didn't have much success. Uh, I didn't have a marketing uh, uh, capability then. That today there are people with incredible marketing capabilities, and I've just now recently started tapping into some of that know-how, and I'm constantly looking now to other people to implement stuff that they're good at, and I basically offered people joint ventures. Hey, do this for me, and I'll do that for you. Okay, we're going to make something profitable. You get part of the profit. Ah, okay. And, and this is coming together. This works. So you don't have to be a jack of all trades. In fact, if I have a really great idea, I don't even have to be a participant to make money at it. I can find other people to be the participants. And if they want to participate, they have to agree that I get a little slice of, of this great idea that I've brought them. Right. But they have the specific skills. And if it takes a half a dozen, six or eight or ten or twelve different kinds of skills, so what? <laughs> we find people who have those skills, who like doing those things. I know what I like to do. I observe, I analyze, I report. The report can be written and it, or it can be verbal. That's really my forte. That's all I really like doing. And now that I'm here and I have this community of interesting talented people around me, more and more I'm able to limit my, my activities to just doing what I'm good at. And so are you, and so are the others, and it's fabulous. Fabulous. And it dispels a lot of fear. Okay? I mean, one of the ways I know that I'm less fearful than I used to be is when I go out now, and I go with, uh, to various events and things around town, I go without carrying any ID. I, I, in the States, I wouldn't dream of leaving the house without an ID because I could wind up in jail for not having one. Here, who gives a hoot? You know, here, I can, I can go around about my business more or less anonymously, and uh, I can ride around in a truck without a license plate. <laughs> I, I'm not concerned about the friggin' police. I'm not concerned about getting shot because I talk back to someone. Oh, my goodness. That's a huge change. This is where the freedom is, folks. If you're in the United States and you're hearing this, <laughs> come down here for a visit. See what it's all about. Get yeah, well, that's, that's the whole other thing is just the, the fear that, you know, like Acapulco. Oh, my God, there's so much, you know, uh, propaganda out there about how dangerous this place is. And it's just, you know... Completely propaganda. irrational. Yeah, it's propaganda. And, and and the same thing with the people in the United States, just even traveling to Mexico. Oh, my God. It's so scary down there with all the drug lords and people. It's a war zone. It's it's worse than Iraq, I think, is one of the, one of the things I saw here recently. It's nonsense. <laughs> it's all propaganda. They want to keep... They want to keep the... the uh, tax cattle within the fences. Yeah. And in fact, when there, when there was serious talk about Trump putting up a wall along the border, my thought was it was to keep us in yeah. rather than to keep the Mexicans out. Well, the problem is, is for most Americans, you know, they're, they're, they're jailed by their fear. Right. And their fear has gotten the best of them. And it's unfortunate that we try and talk to people about you know, new ideas and, and new ways of doing things. And it's the fear that really holds them from even considering the possibility that it's not as bad as it, it could be. It, in fact, it's a lot better than it actually appears to be. Yeah. And, you know, we have the capability, each of us individually, of doing really wonderful things. That's but true. the only way we're going to do those wonderful things is by dispelling the fears that we have. And really, this again is why the Octolog is important, is because this is a way, if it's nothing more than therapy, to dispel the fears that we've been ingrained into our culture right, and into our own personas, that everything has to be, a, be feared it's not the case. There's tons of opportunity, and there's just a, a whole other world waiting for us. Right. If we just get over it. 
Well, I think getting over it can be seen as uh, a realistic task that each of us can undertake. And my answer to it, and maybe not everybody's, but my answer is the soul bonding. Because what the soul bonding process or, or uh, protocol does is it gives us a way to dispel the fears that were instilled in us the first five years of our lives. Those are the deepest fears. Right. Those are always the deepest fears. And once you get control of that, once you get past those early childhood fears that you don't even know as an adult you still have, you get past that, and then suddenly it's like doors and windows opening to new opportunities and new capabilities. And then the other fears, the later fears, the fears that we learned in school, the fears that we learned from government indoctrination, those are much easier to take on when the more basic, deeper fears are handled. Yeah. And we know how to do that, and we can help you do that, and you don't have to live in fear anymore. You, uh, you opened the Athlon uh, training course with a statement. That statement that uh, you can, if you could do anything you want. What was, what's the statement? That you want? Yes. The, the, I, I actually start with most people with a question. What would you set out to do if you knew you could not fail? And once people arrive at that, and it takes so many people, it takes quite a while to find out what that is. <laughs> but once you find that out, it becomes a very compelling, uh, motivating factor that offsets the fear. And then the question becomes, are you doing that? And if not, why not? Yeah. And most people who find answers to these questions, their lives are transformed. Mine was. Once I got through these questions, of course, I spent a lot of, a lot of time and a lot of money on my own personal therapy to get over the early fears that were built into me my first five years. But once those fears were handled... Everything else changed. Everything else. My ability to pull up roots and go somewhere else and do something different came into being, largely, because I was intent on getting over those early fears. And I've done this now repeatedly. I grew up in Ohio, and I took myself out of Ohio. I went to Massachusetts for a while. And then I went back to Ohio for a while. I went to Washington, D.C. for a while. I went out to Oregon, spent 25 years in Oregon, then Florida, 10 years, then, then uh, uh, from Florida to Arizona to be with the freedom activists in Arizona. And now here, the flexibility that it takes to make changes like that in your life, uh, that doesn't come without a price. And the price is overcoming the fear. Okay? Uh, I, I have to admit that part of my coming here from the States is, is realizing that I'm subjected to more fear-inducing influences in the States than I would be here. And I, I see that. That's, that's really clear. I feel freer here every day. And anyone could, who could come here from the States could have the same experience. Because we literally have, demonstrably, more freedom here than in the States. You like freedom? You think that's a great feature of the American way? Great. Come here. You'll like it even better. Yeah, so I, I guess I've got to hit on our, our consulting business again. Because, again, this is, this is another kind of task that we can take on for people. And that is, is, is dealing with, you know all these fears that people have and all these things that kind of stand in their way from making the decisions that can change their life and, and open up this opportunity to do what you want if you couldn't fail. Right. You know, we want to help people do that. We want to help people get over the fears and, and get to the place where they can do the things that they want to do to change the world in the ways that they want to change them, to make their lives the lives that they want to live. We can help you with that, you know, through our consulting company, too. Yeah. So that's, a, that's certainly something that, uh, you know, that we're working on, and it's, it's an octologue, and it's, uh, you know, it's an opportunity for people out there 
to connect into an aqualog and have some have people that can help them in whatever way, shape, or form that they need to get from where they are today to where they want to be. We have the talent to do that, absolutely. And it, it's really awe-inspiring. You know, when I look around me at the people that I've met here, the people I'm associating with every day, uh, this is an awesome community. This is a, a unique something I've never experienced anywhere else. And if you have some grit, <laughs> if you have some courage, if you have, if you have some uh, will to do something meaningful in your life, get on the road to Acapulco. Come here and do it. There's, there's, no, there's so few obstacles here that uh, your chances of, of succeeding are vastly greater here with the help of this community than they would be anywhere else that I've ever been. So I, I, I do want to uh, encourage people, literally, to give people courage, because dealing with fear, uh, it, even facing the fear, takes courage. And everyone has the capacity for courage. Not everyone knows they have that capacity. But when you start hanging out with people who are uninfluenced by the, the highly touted fears, you find out that you've got a lot of courage. You just didn't know you had it. <laughs> yeah. uh, here, it gets amplified. So, fear is certainly... Uh, John, let, me, let me close out with John David Garcia used to believe that fear is the, the belief that one is not sufficiently creative to handle the situation. Now, I disagreed with his definition of fear because I don't think that fear is a belief. I think that having that belief can create fear. Yeah. Belief is an intellectual construct, a thought. Fear is an emotion. It comes from a different part of the brain, actually, than the thought. Thought comes from the neocortex. Fear comes from the so-called mammalian brain, which is below the neocortex. And... The two are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> and if you are sufficiently rational, you can usually find solutions and be very creative. But you do have to diminish the fear enough that you're not operating on adrenaline. You're operating on your mentality. And that's what's happening here. People here are getting out of that fear straitjacket that they experienced back in the States. And they're loving it. You folks in the States, you'd love it too. <laughs> Come and find out. <clears throat> yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I think that's certainly something that I've really come to embrace is this idea that we can, we can solve anything. We, we can overcome any problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the human mind, life, uh, is is here to, to create and, and to, to solve problems. And I'm very confident now that, uh, you know, the system that we have and the, the people that we have and the community that we're building is, is the future. Yeah. It's the future society that we want, that everybody wants to live in. A, a society that's full of people that are uh, resilient, that are free, that are living up to the, the potential that they feel they have within them. They, you know, have skills and abilities. Uh, this is all what this is about, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, when the word finally does get out, <laughs> we're going to be inundated. I but, hope so. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a wonderful place. Yeah, and the thing is, is that we've got a model here that can be taken anywhere, and and it delivers. It delivers peace, prosperity, and freedom. Yeah, not necessarily in that order, but that's what it delivers, and that's what people really want. Yeah, wherever they are. That's what everyone wants. Yeah, and with the technology we have today, everything is possible, I think. And, uh, it's, it's good times ahead, so don't worry about the fear. Yeah. <laughs> good times are ahead. Just let, let that stuff go. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. We'll be more than willing to talk to you about that and address any of the, uh, the questions that people have. We'd certainly love to do that. Absolutely.
So going forward, uh, you know, we, we've covered some different things today, but uh, look forward to the future. I think we're probably going to talk a little bit more about businesses and the Octolog in the future. Certainly. Uh, is there any other topics that you have, Bob, that you might want to cover in the future? I don't have one on the tip of my tongue, but I'm quite certain that we're going to go on having conversations like this, mostly without repeating ourselves. Uh, for quite some time to come, because there's so much, there's so much to know, so much to learn about this stuff. Uh, wh whether it's the dynamics of the octolog or the uh, introduction of the soul bonding into the octolog, uh, these these are very uh, poignant and meaningful things. There was a guy went around, I forget his name now, but he went around back uh, in the 1990s. Uh, giving speeches all around the, the U.S. on the importance of bringing meaning to our existence, to having lives that that have meaning and, and doing work that is meaningful. And he, he whipped up a lot of popularity and, and thousands and thousands of people attended his talks and got excited, and then it went nowhere because he didn't have a mechanism for actually realizing that uh, transformation to a world where people's work is meaningful. Well, th this is it. This is what was missing. That guy, I, I attempted to tell him back then that he was missing out, but he wouldn't listen to me. But now there are people listening, so great. <laughs> we have meaningful work that anyone can get, become a part of, and uh, it's very gratifying. Uh, so by all means, folks, Get on the road to Acapulco. We'll see you here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.